So, a traditional Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. Atheist and agnostic as well. Oh, well. Hi, Preston. Hi, Katie. Have you had any good pasta recently? I had a nice uh, spicy macaroni salad just the Ooh. day before yesterday. Wow. Yeah. We went out for pasta for our anniversary last night. I just had some ravioli. Oh. It's very good. Do you feel like you've been touched by his noodly appendage? I can feel God inside these chilies tonight. <laughs> 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 on today's episode of the, the holy watermelon, watermelon podcast. podcast so you might be wondering why we're talking about restaurants and pasta but we're going to move on to the next holiest of holy books <laughs> and that is the gospel of the flying spaghetti monster praise be <laughs> uh yeah and unlike the histories of all the books we've been talking about for the last couple of months this story really isn't shrouded in mystery because it's within living memory. I was going to say it does have something in common with all the other ones, though. Yeah. It is a piece of fiction. <laughs> uh, we we haven't talked ACP about a book piece. of fiction yet. Mm. Well, that's a tricky thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we do know some things are historical in some of the books. Yeah. But let's just say you mean the main character is fiction and all of them. The main character is fiction in all of them? God. Okay. Yeah. Somebody. <laughs> I don't know I if know. God's the main character in very many of the books we've That's talked true. about so far. Uh, th he probably should be. Maybe we'd have fewer problems. <laughs> so we touched briefly on pastafarianism in our episode way, way back. I think that was in our very first year of recording mm -hmm. on parody religion. So the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster goes hard and has their own religious book which was published in 2006 yeah the gospel of the flying spaghetti monster is the first book on our list that we've been talking about for a little while that has been nominated for a quill award oh in this particular case for humor oh not for a religious book <laughs> correct okay are there re rewards awards for religious books honestly i haven't looked into Probably the not. quill awards okay <laughs> Some universities even had nice things to say about it, particularly the big ones in Pennsylvania. And even famous evolutionary biologist and well-known atheist Richard Dawkins has referred to it in his work. Yeah, there's some reasonably high praise for this book. I mean, it is quite funny. Yeah. And there's a lot, a lot of, of good moral and ethical lessons in it as well. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll get into some of those a little later on. So the flying spaghetti monster... I, I feel like we've touched on at least some of this before, well, but a review. quick recap is yeah. good. Uh, the Flying Spaghetti Monster was first introduced to the world in 2005 when 24-year-old Oregon native Bobby Henderson undertook the massive task of making fun of the Kansas State Board of Education. Nice. What a great mission. <laughs> it's always fun to make fun of people in authority, <laughs> especially when they're doing ridiculous things. Just make uh, sure they don't crucify you. Yeah. Yeah. There is that risk, yeah. historically speaking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Bobby wrote an open letter explaining how the flying spaghetti monster interfered with carbon dating by mucking about with his noodly appendage. Praise be unto him. I just want to point out that his noodly appendage is in all caps. Very important. <laughs> yes. Uh, Bobby demanded that his thesis be given equal time with intelligent design, which the Kansas Public School really felt like it was important to give that equal time with evolution in biology class. A yes. little ridiculous. Yes, they went to give creation and evolution, creationism and evolution on the same face time so that people have choices in what they believe. Yeah. In a high school biology, biology class. class. You know, uh, teaching theology in biology class and again, doesn't feel right. Well, and then a very specific theology. Mm -hmm. We're teaching Christianity, mm -hmm. not... So, well, so, so usually they kept it ambiguous. They didn't name a specific God. So it was but more broadly Judeo-Christian. Sure, yes. <laughs> there's only one religion that actually cares that much about creationism. <laughs> um, yeah. So Bobby Henderson decided to give them an even better option. You want yeah. choices? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a little quote we pulled from the letter. 
I think we can all look forward to the time when these three theories are given equal time in our science classrooms across the country and eventually the world. One third time for intelligent design, one third time for flying spaghetti monsterism, and one third time for logical conjecture based on overwhelming observable as evidence. <laughs> Very sassy. I love it. After publishing the on his website, Bob started getting a lot of attention and death threats, which he also published on his website. <laughs> Yeah, and he actually did eventually get some responses from the Kansas Board of Education. One person responded that it was a serious offense to mock God, which in this particular situation is a lot like telling an adult that they're not going to get anything but coal from Santa Claus. Well, and again, then it's like, well, <laughs> as to my previous point, well, which God? His noodly appendages is Bobby Henderson's God. And if you're not giving him equal face time... This is why it's a parody religion. Yeah. Because if I think I put it in here somewhere, maybe I just read it. Maybe who maybe it's coming later. But if it's a ridiculous thing for a flying spaghetti monster to do, then it's a ridiculous thing to do. Yeah, that's pretty fair. <laughs> uh, before the end of that year, two thousand five, Bobby was approached by a few publishers that wanted to turn this attention into profits. And Villard won the bid by offering Bobby a substantial advance for some sort of gospel. And that's how we got the book we have today. The gospel, which can be found online, or I'm sure purchased through Amazon, mm -hmm. um, opens with a disclaimer. While pastafarianism is the only religion based on empirical evidence, it should also be noted that this is a faith-based book. Attentive readers will note numerous holes and contradictions throughout the text. They will even find blatant lies and exaggerations. These have been placed there to test the reader's faith. <laughs> it's just like dripping with sass. Right? I love this disclaimer because while it seems perfectly appropriate as addressing the subject matter that is the book, it's also a great cop-out for just running through it without any editorial process. You don't have to worry about fixing contradictions. You've already written off an excuse. Absolutely. And I mean, it's <laughs> it's basically what other religious groups will say when people find contradictions in their holy book. Pretty much. So <laughs> it's perfect. He's just putting a light on what everyone knows. Yeah. It's Is that great. holy books have contradictions. <laughs> Especially when they're <clears throat> written by committees over centuries. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and not even written by potentially eyewitnesses. Some of them were, but some of them weren't. Yeah. All right. So, like all good religions, pastafarianism, of course, has a creation myth. How do we explain how everything got here with that's, his noodly appendages? That's the basis of religion. Yeah. So, the flying spaghetti monster created the universe and also spent a lot of time making it look older than it really is. So the flying spaghetti monster, praise be unto him, uh, created the universe 5,000 years ago. I think it's worth noting here that this is more recent than even your hardcore evangelical Christians will say. Yes. I did say this uh, sounds very sim similar to the Ken Ham argument where humans and dinosaurs live side by side. And then the flying spaghetti monster messed with carbon dating. So everything's actually older. than It right. looks older than 5,000 years, but it's not. Have you heard of Last Thursdayism? I feel like I've heard of it, but I don't have any brain files on it. It's the the idea that the entire universe was created just last Thursday. And every piece of evidence that you have to the contrary is also fabricated, including all memories you have of everything that happened before last Thursday. Entirely fabricated. That's a bit of a matrix mindfuck. Right? <laughs> I feel like, please see our episode on belief. <laughs> What's it called? Our episode, our episode on belief. belief. Don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. I just feel like it ties in well with yeah. that horrifying thought. <laughs> yeah, so there's this idea of a young Earth and a young universe is actually really quite interesting. And I think we're going to have to dive into that a little bit okay, later, Okay, well, we should put that on our list when we're done recording. So there are several stories in the Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster that might seem a little bit familiar to you, including that the Flying Spaghetti Monster actually created the Earth in just, well, in fewer than seven days, but in seven days. <laughs> I mean, even 
the Judeo-Christian narrative has the earth created in less than seven days. There you go. But let's take a look at the wonderful narrative we have of the noodliness. So on the first day, just like in the Hebrew Bible, the flying spaghetti monster said, let there be light. And he called the light day and he called the dark prime time. <laughs> <laughs> the second day, just like we're familiar with in the Hebrew Bible, he also called upon the firmament so that there would be a safe harbor for the pirates. Um, and he also created beer spewing volcanoes. Wonderful. I, I hate beer, so this isn't very appealing to well, me. Well, don't but... worry. <laughs> Some people are upset by what happened on the third day because the flying spaghetti monster was hungover from the beer spewing volcanoes mm -hmm. and forgot what he had created the day before. So he wanted to create land, but there was already the firmament. 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 I'm mm -hmm. not too excited. <laughs> and so he set the firmin, firmament. Fir, firmament. <laughs> firmament. <laughs> firmament. Up to become heaven and created land and separate from the sea. He dried out his noodly appendages <laughs> in the light. Also had the earth bring forth, and I quote, whatever can be turned into food that resembles my noodly appendages. <laughs> so grass, semolina, and rice. And with the firmament going up to heaven, he sent the beer spewing volcanoes up there as well, which is why we don't see them on earth. Today. Right. But of course, the goal is to get to heaven. To get to the beer spewing Where, well. yes. Absolutely. And stripper factory. Yep. Honey <laughs> pee. On the fourth day, the flying spaghetti monster created the moon because he couldn't get comfy at night. I think he was scared of the dark. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and so while the flying spaghetti monster created animals on the fifth day, he also got really drunk on volcano beer. So when he rolled out of bed at that evening and landed on the firmament, it let out the Big Bang. <laughs> and he was shocked while he was drunk. He had created man. And he was like, what the fuck did I do? Right. And he declared that he needed a break. Therefore, in Pastafarianism, every Friday is a holiday. Praise be. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so, of course, the mythology of this book continues on in a similar vein, leaning heavily on the stories that are common in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but with a really great twist. And I think it's worth continuing on summarizing these stories. There are some good stories <laughs> in this gospel. Yeah, so the story of the first man and woman is called the Olive Garden of Eden. Uh, it's a fun take on the biblical tale that leads directly into the flood narrative. The flood comes when the flying spaghetti monster craves breadsticks, I mean... but they're all gone because the first people ate oh. them all. <laughs> Damn it. Like when you get to Olive Garden too late. I've never had that problem. No, I don't, I don't think they have that problem. But when they're not like hot... That's really upsetting. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. You know, you can just take them home, too, if you ask, and put them in a toaster oven. Good time. Oh. <laughs> okay. Minor detour. All right. So, Flying Spaghetti Monster starts in his rage at the lack of breadsticks, but does end up taking generations to cook a huge pot of noodles. Oh. And then he dumps the water <gasps> very carefully down the drain. You thought I was going to say on the people. I mean, it's clearly too much water. <laughs> uh, so the problem is the drain empties out into the world. Okay. He didn't realize it. Uh, so listeners, I if you haven't noticed yet, the flying spaghetti monster is a dumbass. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely not omnipotent. Omnipotent? Omnip omni omniscient? Uh, omniscient? Yeah. Out that. He's okay. definitely not omniscient. <laughs> yeah. We'll get we'll get back to that too. <laughs> Only later did he realize that he had emptied out all of his hot spaghetti water onto the world, flooding it. Mm, Darchy. Yeah. Have you ever um, left a little bit of your pasta water in the sink by accident? No. And it got caught in a bowl or something else was sitting in your sink. N not. D avoid it. Okay. <laughs> this has happened in my house. It is nasty. I believe that. So anyway, luckily Noah and his family just happened to be on a great boat. So they floated in the stinky, slimy noodle water for nearly three fortnights, occasionally fighting off pirates. Wow. Yeah. So Brave. the story doesn't say Noah and his family were the only survivors. In fact, they had to fight off pirates. Pirates are also an important theme throughout the 
entire pastafarian yes, mythology. Yes, if you're, you're proselytizing, you typically dress up as a pirate. Now, I like the Tower of Scrapple. <laughs> so, of course, Noah had three sons, which we know from the Hebrew Bible. Ham, cheese, and amel. <laughs> And when they spread out after the Great Flood, they started the nations of hammies, cheeses, and omelets. <laughs> now, of course, the, the Tower of Scrapple focuses on ham. And he was entrepreneurial and wanted to make some extra cash, but he was also a bit of a grifter. And so he created a food product he called Scrapple, which was pig snouts and sawdust. <laughs> uh, it didn't sell. <laughs> shockingly uh, and rather just piled up over time so his friend Nimrod suggested calling the pile of food the Tower of Scrapple as like a tourist attraction but it literally stank to high heaven and the flying spaghetti monster came down and was like what the fuck demolished this it's <laughs> disgusting <laughs> so uh, yeah terrible time and apparently the smell caused Nimrod to go a little wacky too there you go. <laughs> the next story is a little bit later on in history, but not as recent as it might sound initially. Phil, the night manager, started to worry about having too many short order cooks. These short order cooks literally come out of nowhere, so I <laughs> yeah. had trouble summarizing. I was very confused. But... So all these people from the age of the Tower of Scrapple, became be short order many cooks. of them became short order okay. cooks, I guess. All right. That seems to be the narrative flow. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to do a, a study, a Bible study on this gospel. Anyway. Uh, anyway, too many short order cooks. So Phil ordered that no more short order cooks should be hired. That seems like a pretty yeah. reasonable solution. Supply and demand, yeah. Uh, but then this fella named Mosey managed to talk his way into a job as a short order cook. Presumably the order, the owner didn't really care what Phil wanted. I heard that Mosey was a protege of a short order cook. <laughs> he's very good at it. Yeah, that's he's managed to get this great job. Well, it wasn't that great. It's a short order cook job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he got tired of the treatment in the kitchen, so he quit to become a pirate. Which got the flying spaghetti monster's attention because he is way into pirates. Way into pirates. So he decided, I'm going to talk to Mosey. But of course, you don't get to talk to the flying spaghetti monster face to face. Oh, your Talking brain to would God know. would just, yeah, too, too shocking. So he speaks to Mosey through a toasted marshmallow. Nice. You know, like a burning bush, but different. Tastier. <laughs> yeah. And the flying spaghetti monster told Mosey to liberate the other cooks in Phil's kitchen because... Things were going so badly in there. But Phil refused to release the cook's last paycheck if they followed Mosey. So the flying spaghetti monster sent three plagues. Oh, no. A rain of spaghetti sauce, which is like a rain of frogs or locusts, combined with the river turning to blood, I guess. it's We're not ten plagues. It's just three. So yeah. condensing as much as we can here. <laughs> Hail in the form of linguine. Ouch. Right? And then the last plague, specifically targeting Phil. Oh, no. Was to have the worst music play inside his head continually. And, of course, the author tells us that this worst song to play inside his head was Kid Abyssinia's I'm the Makata Daddy. I haven't heard that song, but now I might have to post it in our Discord. Yeah, Did we're you definitely going to post it in our Discord. No, I have not listened okay. to it. <laughs> but we'll definitely have to post it in our Discord. Okay. And Phil let them go. And that's how we get passed over. When is passed over? So the story doesn't actually tell us exactly when it takes place. I but have my phone on me to Google. The, the way it's described a little later on in the book <coughs> is that it does act analogously with Passover and Easter. Easter. So probably then, but if you're going to take a more liberal interpretation of scripture, maybe it's today. Okay. I'm <laughs> just wondering if in addition to St. Bernard's feast day, we should also host a Passover. I like it. All right. <laughs> Which we should uh, get planning that's coming up. Yeah, it is. Now, 
Mosey is a pirate captain, and he led his pirates to Mount Salsa. He hoped to find a pirate ship that he had spent years searching for. I bet it was 40. But of course, <laughs> you won't find a ship on the top of a mountain. The flying spaghetti monster told the pirates that they belonged on the open seas. Uh, and this admoni- admonition embarrassed Pirate Mosey, and he stayed on the top of the mountain when everyone else went down. <laughs> So eventually, the flying spaghetti monster got tired of waiting for Mosey and gave him some advice in the form of ten stone tablets, two of which Pirate Mosey ended up dropping. Now, this is definitely just copying Mel Brooks' History of the World Part 1. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Which left left him with with the eight, I'd really rather you didn't. (laughs) Would you like to take turns on these press? Sure, let's do it. All right, the first... I'd really rather you didn't act like a sanctimonious, holier-than-thou ass when describing my noodly goodness. If some people don't believe in me, that's okay. Really, I'm not that vain. Besides, this isn't about them, so don't change the subject. I like it. Number two, I'd really rather you didn't use my existence as a mean to oppress, subjugate, punish, eviscerate, and or, you know, be mean to others. I don't require sacrifices, and purity is for drinking water, not people. Yep. Yeah, that's some helpful advice so far. All right. This one's great. Number three, I'd really rather you didn't judge people for the way they look or how they dress or the way they talk or, well, just play nice, okay? Oh, and get this in your thick heads. Woman equals person. Man equals person. Samey, (laughs) samey. One is not better than the other. Unless we're talking about fashion, and I'm sorry, but I gave that to women and some guys who know the difference between teal and fuchsia. (laughs) Do you know the difference between teal and fuchsia? I mean, I couldn't describe them terribly effectively to somebody who is a color expert like yourself in any satisfactory way. But if I held up a teal is a blue green. Yes. And fuchsia is kind of close to magenta. Oh, very good. Okay, so. (laughs) Yay. Number four, I'd really rather you didn't indulge in contact, conduct that offends yourself or your willing, consenting partner of legal age and mental maturity. As for anyone who might object, I think the expression is go fuck yourself unless they find that offensive, in which case they can turn off the TV for once and go for a walk for a change. Wow. <laughs> that was aggressive. I like it. So, so far we have things that we can condense down into... Don't be a dick. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> but we're only halfway through. It's also much more blatant of not being a dick. Yeah. This theme does continue. Number five. I'd really rather you didn't challenge the bigoted, misogynist, hateful ideas of others on an empty stomach. Eat, then go after the bitches. I thought that was bastard. Uh, it's all start out. Yeah. I'm how just... many How many stars do we have? Six. It could be either. Oh, okay. It could be either. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll have to pray for some insight. <laughs> Number six. I'd really rather you didn't build multi-million dollar churches, temples, mosques, shrines to my noodly goodness when the money could be better spent. Take your pick on A, ending poverty, B, B, curing diseases, C, living in peace, loving with passion, and lowering the cost of cable. I might be a complex carbohydrate, omniscient being. Debatable. But I enjoy the simple <laughs> things in life. I ought to know I am the creator. Well, I, I know you're questioning the omniscient thing for reasons that we've already discussed. But I think if you look around, you'll find a lot of people overestimate their own intelligence. That's true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and perception is reality. If he think he's yeah. omniscient. And he's the creator. <laughs> then he must be. Uh, number seven, I'd really rather you didn't go around telling people I talk to you. You're not that interesting. Get over yourself. And I told you to love your fellow man. Can't you take a hint? <laughs> and lastly, except we'll never know about the missing two. Right. I'd really rather you didn't do unto others as you would have them do unto you if you are into, um, stuff that uses a lot of leather, lubricant, Las Vegas. If the other person is into it, however, so into number four then have at it. Take pictures, and for the love of Mike, wear a condom. Honestly, it's a piece of rubber. If I didn't want it to feel good when you did it, I wouldn't have, I would have added spikes or something. <laughs> wow. Sex does feel very noodly. <laughs> <laughs> does it? <laughs> I mean, it's wet. 
Do I want to know <laughs> what you've been experimenting with? <laughs> I mean, wow. <if> any <laughs> changing the subject. Uh, yeah, we've already had our sexy months. <laughs> All right. Well, this book goes on to explore more modern history, listing many of the great scientific minds as heretics, uh -huh. including fellows like Leonardo da Vinci. Also throws Dolly, the, the clone sheep, in. Poor Dolly. As proof of Didn't people Didn't they call her like ridiculous. a whore or something? Or yeah. a bitch or something? Yeah. They insult her. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It is. <laughs> but they have fun with it. And of course, it goes on. Not, they're not just heretics for doing science. It gets a little bit more exciting. But we can't spoil all of the secrets of this book. Yes. <laughs> There is a guide to evangelizing, proselytizing, or simply spreading religious propaganda and how to deal with people of other faiths. There's also a list of holidays. Yep. So we've talked about Passover ever so briefly, and now we'll get into it a little bit more. So being analogous to Passover should be obvious in the name. This does get a little bit punny in some of these, but that's okay. Um, it's all about eating lots of spaghetti dressed as pirates. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Everybody takes turns wearing a communal eye patch. Weird. That you pass around the table. And everybody shares why they're grateful to have been touched by the spaghetti's noodly appendage. I love the word spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti. Ah. Uh. It doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but it is no, a it's, good it's, word. No, you have no idea how much I practiced saying that this morning. <laughs> Spaghetti. Spaghetti. Then, of course, we have the month of Ramadan. So this conveniently lines up with the Muslims' month of Ramadan. Ramadan, excuse me. What if Passover and Ramadan happen in the same month? Because it changes. Well, see, the rules of how much observation you put into Ramadan are pretty loosey-goosey that you could take the day that you want to celebrate passed over and, and celebrate eat Ramadan. spaghetti that day instead of ramen. Perfect. So I was going to say, so how do we celebrate Ramadan? Uh, past parents do not fast or pray, but eat only ramen for a few days to remember their days as starving college students. At the end of Ramadan, when everybody's sick of ramen, pastafarians are encouraged to donate their leftover ramen to those who need it more. Makes so perfect nice. sense. It's like Thanksgiving, but at a time that cycles through the year. <laughs> and also, yeah, it also doesn't say, it just says a few days, so you can just do yeah. ramen for three or four days. Yeah, we're not talking a whole month. No. <laughs> I might celebrate ramen done, too. <laughs> uh, Halloween is on the list of Pastafarian holidays. Specifically, Pastafarians are called to honor pirates that used to roam the seas more freely in ages past. Pastafarians are encouraged to travel in search of candy, wenches, and grog. I love it. <laughs> I didn't know this was a Pastafarian holiday. International Talk Like a Pirate Day. Oh, yeah. I've heard lots of people talk about International Talk Like a Pirate Day. Mm -hmm. It's even on The Sims. Sure. So they're bringing, they're putting the past to back into Christmas. Yeah. Well, it's... I don't know what the <laughs> Christ and Christmas, uh, I don't know what the... Yeah. the correct term is but I mean uh, it's been a decade and a half and it got very popular very quickly on internet message boards and encyclopedia actually helped spread pastafarianism nice. for a little while so that's September 19th conveniently just over a month after St. Bernard's Feast Day right <laughs> mark it on your holy calendars <laughs> um, we mentioned before Friday is the holiest day so take it easy and try to spend some time in the sun. Friday is the day to reflect on the ideals of the beer volcano and the stripper factory, which may be represented in some other way in your life, however you feel appropriate, but be a spaghetti type of pious. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it's giving you a free pass on Friday night. Um, and then there's a holiday called holiday and it runs from december into january basically covering the all the biggest commercial holidays yeah 
In fact, the book gave a special thank you shout out to Walmart for stopping the print of Merry Christmas things and just saying Happy Holidays. And Pastafarians counted that as a major win. Yeah. And that's fair. I think anybody who doesn't celebrate Christmas would feel just a little bit more welcome in that space. We Happy Holidays, bitches. We right? did a whole episode on it. Yeah. Man, that was a couple of years ago now. I know. We've been doing this for so long. I know. <laughs> Uh, the book, of course, also has an appendix with a whole bunch of content from other do- devotees of the Flying Spaghetti Monster movement. Yeah, quite a lot of content. It's really cool. You got pamphlets, a whole bunch of essays, some really good arguments that look like they do a really good job proving this, but the Flying Spaghetti Monster must be legit, including some hard math. I mean, and it comes back down to like Russell's teapot and Invisible Pink Unicorn. I mean, it's as provable as anything else. Yeah. Uh, There was a network a little while ago that was offering a million dollars in spaghetti funds, which who knows what the conversion is on that, offering the money to anybody who could prove that Jesus is not the son of the flying spaghetti monster. Now, proving a negative is incredibly hard in any situation. This is a little harder. So, of course... You know, they can offer whatever they wanted. They actually didn't even start at a million. It started out at a much smaller number. And then they're like, yeah, we can offer whatever we want. So they jacked up the number. And nobody can do it. <laughs> we didn't talk about the variations because all holy books have variations, at least. Kind of. <laughs> um, the Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster has been published in French, German, Danish, and Russian. But the text hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not major differences in text. Just not in 15, a great honor. 15, 18 years. Yeah, a good honor to be published in in translations. Oh, absolutely. So there are other books within this Pastafarian movement. And I love the title of the first one that came out in 2010 called The Loose Canon. We, we'll talk a little bit more in our next episode about what canon really means. But it's, you know, a loose collection of books. I like it. Just a compilation of writings by various fans who are into the movement. Perfect. And then the New Testament of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, Dinner 2.0, the new and improved recipe, came out in 2018. And it's got a dozen subdivisions named for various kinds of pasta. And it's used by subgroups. There's there's break off churches. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, We've got the Unitarian Church of Pasta. And the Flying Spaghetti Monster Revival Church of Zidi. Oh. Uh, and this that book is used delicious. by them. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sure there's more to come. <laughs> I think, honestly, as we start to see more Christian nationalism, as scary as it is, we'll probably see more things like this that challenge the logic of... Uh, of being an ass. Of being an ass, of, <laughs> of bringing together church and state, as opposed to having a separation of church and state. Yeah. It's great to talk about creationism, but then you better talk about my version of creationism, too. Right. And everyone else's. And mine is ridiculous. It involves a beer <laughs> volcano. <laughs> and strippers. Yeah. But there are places in the world where flying spaghetti monsterism is getting real legal recognition. The Dutch won't recognize the Flying Spaghetti Monster Church. They're not having any fun with it at all. But New Zealanders in particular are really doing a good job of embracing it culturally. And you can get married or get your photo ID with a colander on your head. Nice. I found an article. It was on Bloomberg so I can read it without paying. Um, But the, the title was, Is God a Spaghetti Monster? That's a real legal question. Yeah, there's there's an awful lot of debate on the the cultural and legal validity of Pastafarianism because there's so many states that require a legal authority to validate a religious authority to perform marriages legally, which is really quite dumb. I don't think there should be any laws on marriage at all anywhere that just causes problems. Instead, we have to deal with all these weird hoops that people want to jump through. And you get labels like ordination mills, because you can perform a marriage with a 
flying spaghetti monster ordination for just 20 bucks. Hey, I'm pretty sure we're close to being able to ordain people. Yeah. Wasn't it three years? Yeah. Okay, well. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> and can be a priest of the watermelon. It'll be great. One of the big arguments that's alluded to often in this book and then pointed out specifically in a couple other places is unintelligent design. The spaghetti monster is a fool, very careless. And that's a, an important detail for a lot of the things that show up in the world. Intelligent design is really ridiculed in this book, but unintelligent design being the basis for why does the platypus have a duck bill? It's the only mammal, so it can't be any good. <laughs> also lays eggs. Yeah. And llamas, they're ridiculous, and nobody knows how to spell llama. So unintelligent design. <laughs> it's uh, There's a lot of that in this book. And it's a pretty good argument for its purpose of just keeping science class in the realm of science. Okay. Yeah. Which is why we don't usually get too terribly deep into theological discourse in this show yet. We've got to have our strong basis of history and science and literature. Yeah. <laughs> and religion. And yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what it all amalgamates to. Anthropology yeah. and sociology. Yeah. Yeah. The study of religion is so many humanist sciences. Which is why it's freaking cool. Yeah. Well, we definitely want to hear from you guys. So jump onto our Discord. Check us out on Facebook or Instagram. Give us a shout. We can also get some of your support. That would be wonderful. On Patreon, where Katie's doing her first Bible study. Woohoo! <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Uh, for We've got our book club where we study other books that aren't scriptural for now. We'll see what comes. We can't say for sure yet. Future is vast and unpredictable. If there is a future, maybe we're just repeating the same seven days as per last Thursdayism. <laughs> uh, what a mess this universe could be. <laughs> and we wouldn't even know. Uh, and if you want to really get something concrete for your dollar, check out our shop. We got all kinds of great merch. We released some new stuff fairly recently as well. So if you haven't checked it out uh, in that. the last couple months, check it out. There's new stuff on there. Thanks for joining us. Peace, Peace be, be with, with you. you. And his noodly appendages. <laughs> By the late Middle Ages, the Christian prophecy.